Welcome to Backyard Cigars, and today we are going to take a trip down memory lane with an old classic Cuban cigar brand. But first, we're going to read some notes before we head out and we venture out to Trenton, New Jersey, where we take a visit to the old factory that manufactured La Corona cigars. Now, La Corona Havana Cigar and Tobacco Factory is limited, and uh, the manufacturers, the cigars of the Corona Factory have a well-established reputation wherever fine cigars are consumed, but enjoy a special flavor with smokers among the English aristocracy, as the tobacco used in their manufacture is of sufficiently full weight, or as the Cuban says, quality. To hold its delightful flavor through months and years, the cigars acquire increased smoothness and mellowness with age. These are qualities appealing very strongly to English taste, which demands that cigars be well-aged and seasoned. The Corona is a cigar which unites medium strength with full flavor and aroma. Another valuable characteristic of the Corona cigar is due to the fact that nearly all of the workmen of this factory have been steadily employed there for many years. The consumer has thus an added security of perfect workmanship in these cigars and may always rely on their even draw and burn. The Corona size of the Corona factory is a cigar that has been duplicated in shape, size, and name by practically every factory in Cuba. And at such reduction from the Corona price as to give the dealer a larger profit. But instead of the sale of the Coronas de la Corona being interfered with, they have shown a steady increase. And these cigars remain as absolutely standard in the English mark as is a perfecto in the United States. The same thing is true, though to a lesser degree, of the Corona Alfred de Rothschild's Extra, a size which also originated in this factory. Havana Cigars, a smoker's catalog, giving a brief description of the cigar. Henry Clay and Bach and Company, New York. And this is from 1908 Google Books. The end of the Tabacalera Cubana. Long before the revolution, the commitment of the Americans in Cuba changed. In 1932, they moved the production of some brands to Trenton, New Jersey, having had their own factory built there. It was similar in furnishings to the Palacia Alta Dama, the second La Corona factory in Havana, what drove this procedure forward were mainly the high import duties. It was far cheaper to import Cuban tobacco to the United States than already rolled cigars. In 1960, following the victory of the revolution and the arrival of troops in Havana, the Cuban state assumed leadership of the cigar industry. All factories were nationalized. The brand produced in this factory, among them also La Corona, quickly lost importance in Cuba. With the embargo, the market for sales in the United States had completely collapsed by 1962. The La Corona cigar brand was still manufactured in fewer numbers into the 70s, but then production was totally discontinued. And then we have some brand note status. La Corona is a discontinued pre-revolution Habanos SA brand. It was established around 1845 and was popular particularly in the USA. Prior to the revolution, the brand continued to be produced in small quantities after the embargo until it was discontinued around 1978. The brand was relaunched in 1989 as an inexpensive machine-made cigar. This iteration of the marquee was discontinued in 1999. Generally, the range comprised mild-strength cigars using long-filler tobacco from the Huerta Abajo region. It had a limited distribution in the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, Hungary, etc. There is a non-Cuban brand with the same name, Zeno Davidoff, in his famous book, The Connoisseur's Book of the Cigar, claims that Cuban cigar brands would save their best tobacco leaves for Corona Vitolas, the king of cigars, as he called it. These Coronas measure 14 centimeters in length by 42 ring gauge, a very popular format at the time. La Corona is a famous pre-revolution brand of Cuban cigars. Now, 
Established circa in 1945, yes, it was eventually discontinued around the late 1970s, we know this, but it was bought and sold many times throughout its life. La Corona started as a brand in 1845 by, by José Cabalgas y Cia in Cuba, but the cigars made eventually were produced clear Havanas in the U.S. as far back as the early 1930s. This lot of La Corona Coronas were made in the 1950s when American Tobacco owned the label. So now we're talking here about this specific cigar. This specific cigar, and this is the information that was given to me by the retailer. I'll, re I'll repeat again. Bought and sold many times during its life. La Corona started as a brand in 1845 by Jose Cabalgas y Cia in Cuba. But the cigars made eventually produced clear Havanas in the U.S. as far back as the early 1930s. This lot of La Corona Coronas were made in the 1950s when American Tobacco Company owned the label. Rolled in the Henry Clay and Bach and Company factory in Trenton, New Jersey. Once a favorite of legendary gangster Al Capone, these box press cigars are in very good condition considering their age. Their overall flavor profile is one with roasted nuts, umami, black pepper, and an underlying cream note, and their strength still airs on the side of medium bodied. Length 165 millimeters, 6.5 inches. Ring gauge, 43. So there we have a slight difference in what the actual size is. That's not a big deal. Now here we have an ad from the 1920s. La Corona, half a corona. Now, a trial of this choice Havana cigar will convince even the most skeptical that for quality, it is unsurpassed. Differing only in length from the famous La Corona Corona, it shares its great reputation for fullness of flavor. Order a box today from any high-class tobacconist. And then it goes on to list the price here. Sample box of 25 for 31 I'm assuming that's $31. Actual, taste, actual size of La Corona half a Corona, 3 and, a, and three one eighth inches. So that's this is the actual size. Obviously, that is not... The cigar that I have here. This is the Corona, La Corona, the famous La Corona, La Corona. This next article here is from the Glasgow Herald, June 25th, 1930. And it uh, shows an ad here which says, the standard by which all cigars are judged, La Corona, Corona. There you go. That is the same cigar, not the actual size, of course, on the, and this is what it says. Without harmony, it may be a cigar, but not La Corona Corona. That is why La Corona Corona is alone in quality. Every factor necessary is a really good Havana cigar. Every factor necessary in a really good Havana cigar is there. The searching selection of the pick of the tobacco crop, the subtle blending, the final Deft touches of skillful hands. Each quality adding its quota in perfect harmony until perfection is achieved. La Corona Corona permanently sets a standard by which all other cigars are judged. And as you can see, Zeno Davidoff talked about that. Here you have the same ad and it specifies La Corona Corona newspaper ad from June 19th, 1930. And it, it's basically a repeat of what you just saw, but blown up a little bit more so that you can get a better look at it. And if you'd like to read that, you can. Now, this ad is repeated in a website that talks about Al Capone's love for La Corona Corona's cigars. So apparently uh, Winston Churchill wasn't the only one in love with this cigar. And frankly, to be honest with you, I don't really care what Al Capone liked or what he smoked. Um, he isn't one of my idols or anyone that I look up to in any way. But uh, this uh, website does uh, give a little bit of information on the cigar. So let's let's see here. Now that all now that we all know that Al smoked the local stogie called Have a Tampa, which were clear Havanas, 
But how about this Cuban choice? Through Miami newspaper published Fred Gerton's account of his many times attending Al Capone's parties at the Miami home, we finally get to know what Cuban cigar Capone favored. Which one? The most expensive Cuban cigar smoked by rich people and the big shots in that era was La Corona Coronas, made at the Corona Factory cigar, cigar Factory in Havana. The factory building still stands today. The La Corona Cuban brand is today extinct among, although a Honduras still makes a crappy cigar using their same logo and label. The Cuban La Corona brand later had the tobacco from Havana shipped to the U.S. and assembled there, making the stogies more affordable to the masses. The brand ceased to exist in the 1960s, but made a brief, brief and short-lived comeback in the 80s to the 90s. I was lucky enough to find and purchase three well-preserved La Coronas dating from over 60 years ago, back in Al's era. The La Corona cost a dollar per stick, while the working man was smoking five cent cigars. So that's something that we're going to discuss in a later video about uh, the price of cigars. And we often hear uh, what this country really needs is a good five cent cigar. And that was something that was said in the United States quite often uh, in the early part of the 19th century. But, but, uh, but cigar prices can be confusing to some in the sense that, you know, you read about how very good cigars would cost you five cent, ten cents. Uh, but we rarely hear about what other cigars cost. And there will be a video that will be detailing the cost of cigars and what they would be worth today if, if in, with inflation, of course, inflation, dirty word nowadays. But yes, it did occur. There's Al Capone probably dealing with syphilis in jail at that point in time. And there is a La Corona's Corona uh, band from 1926. It might be. Now, that gentleman was able to acquire, and I don't know from what time uh, that gentleman acquired that cigar, but he was referring to acquiring a cigar from the time of Al Capone, which would have been a La Corona Corona from uh, before 1932. So it, it would have been the, the same Corona cigar that Al Capone and, and Winston Churchill was uh, getting from Cuba, from the Cuban factory. But here we have, again, in the Glasgow Herald, December 13th, 1932. La Corona moves. An important announcement of interest to every cigar smoker. Better cigars at less cost. The factory of the finest cigars in all the world, La Corona, has been moved from Cuba to USA. As herefore, the use of only the finest selected Havana tobacco from the famous Vuelta Abajo plantations, renowned for, be for keeping qualities ensures the maintenance of the La Corona standard of quality. The curing, the stripping, and blending of the leaf is continued in Havana. The rolling and packing operations being conducted at the new factory erected by Henry Clay and Bach and Company Limited at Trenton, USA. This factory is air-conditioned throughout, scientifically controlled to maintain and even an appropriate temperature and degree of humidity essential to the proper manipulation of the delicate Vuelta Abajo leaf, a vital factor in cigar rolling, but a condition which is only intermittently available in Cuba. This and many other improvements made possible under the new hygienic manufacturing conditions has resulted in greater uniformity of workmanship, more accurate leaf selection. These improvements will be apparent to the discriminating smoker, who will appreciate the even burn and ease of smoking by the elimination of wasteful methods. These better cigars will cost the consumer, notwithstanding the adverse rate of exchange, now in operation, less than formerly. 
the La Corona move is constructive, progressive step in cigar production. A definite benefit to smokers of fine cigars. Havana tobacco cigars grown in Cuba, blended in Havana, rolled and packed in USA. Now, once again, the uh, Glasgow Herald, December 14th, 1932, uh, prints another article with, of course, informing the cigar smoker that cheaper Corona cigars are available. Cheaper La Corona cigars will be barely, barely available to the public following the arrival of the first shipment of these cigars from America. The new La Corona cigars, which are now rolled in Trenton, New Jersey, are made from tobacco grown in the famous Huerta Abajo district of Cuba by Henry Clay and Bach and Company Limited, the manufacturing company, which have 7,000 acres under cultivation there. The Huerta Abajo leaf, which is the finest tobacco grown on the island of Cuba, being renowned for its keeping qualities. Scientific methods have been adopted to make possible the rolling of the cigars in the Trenton factory under exactly the same conditions as in Havana. Economics resulting from the change will, moreover, enable the smoking public to get their La Corona cigars at lower prices. The adverse rate of exchange at present prevents the full benefit being felt, but one of the immediate effects, for instances, will be that La Corona, half a Coronas, will be available to the public at six cents Per, and I can't make that out, as against, uh, I guess that's the other price, or a shilling as against one shilling. I really couldn't make that out, but it's indicating the price differences. This is a La Corona cigar ad that I printed off eBay from 1958. La Corona, the cigar by which other cigars are judged, handmade in Cuba, in, in Havana, uh, supreme world the world ever and uh, of course if it is indeed a 1958 la corona cigar ad handmade in havana would be incorrect so i'm thinking that whoever is selling this particular uh poster on ebay is uh probably incorrect about the 1958 date because handmade in havana would have meant that these cigars were being rolled in Havana, in the original Cuban factory, which, as we know, was closed down in 1930. So uh, this cigar is from the 1950s, looks identical, as they should, but I doubt that this ad is from 1958. It's more than likely from the 1930s. If you want to take a look, if you want to take a look at some of the La Corona cigars and what they look like here, uh, in 1989, discontinued in 1999, in cellophane, they were machine made and they were a mix of basically Central American and Caribbean tobaccos, uh, machine made, homogenized wrapper, no binder, and this is what was being sold until the 90s. So this is a close up of the cigar, as you can see here. And just so you know, uh, we're, we're going to go through the process like we normally do of the light rinsing so that you can witness that and i know you've seen it before when i've done it with vintage cigars well you'll see it again today but before you see that this little baby is going to take a trip back home to where it was born trenton new jersey join me for that and then join me for the rinsing before we smoke this cigar before I smoke it and you get to watch me. Here we can see the staircases in the Spanish revival style that lead up towards the top to further rooms up top. Welcome to the Henry Clay and Bach and Company Tobacco Factory. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this factory on this road trip here in Trenton, New Jersey. So as we can see here, you have some of the Spanish style influence.
Welcome to Backyard Cigars and today's trip is actually a historical trip. Uh, not long ago I purchased a cigar from La Corona Cigar Factory and this cigar is about 64 years old. It was made in the 1950s but I was very interested in its history and how it came to be and everything else about it. Now La Corona brand is uh, a brand that goes back to 1845 and in 1845 this is when the brand began development under the Cuban government now in this particular place that we are at here this is 570 Grand Street I believe or 534 543 Grand Street in Trenton New Jersey this is the original location of La Corona cigar factory it was actually called the Henry Clay and Bach and company tobacco factory and it was built in 1932 now one of the main reasons that they came here in 1932 was because import taxes had risen in Cuba and in the midst of it all there was also a, a cigar workers strike in Cuba in the Huerta Abajo region which is uh, where a lot of the tobacco uh, that is used in these cigars is from so you had these import taxes that were were going up it was cheaper to import cuban tobacco into the united states than it was to send in rolled cigars so they decided what we're going to do is we're going to open up this factory and in 1932 henry clay and bach and company opened up this factory now at the time uh tabacalera cubana uh ran the company and it was one of cuba's most beloved uh, cigar brands. Uh, people like Winston Churchill loved this cigar brand and cherished it. Again, a lot of people have talked about just how popular it was and just how good the tobacco used in these cigars was. They were priced for aging amongst other things, but today this particular um, cigar factory is uh, a condominium in the 1980s they decided to turn this into condominiums but in 1932 this was a busy cigar place and you had a lot of individuals working here in trenton new jersey cranking out la corona cigars henry box cigars all kinds of cigars and they were clear havanas they were using long filler cuban tobacco and this is where it all happened now they modeled this particular factory out of the second Corona cigar factory in Cuba which was named Palacio Altadama. Now Palacio Altadama was built in the Spanish revival style of architecture and so this is the building that actually is built in that style and again 1932 they wanted to create this feeling of we're still in Cuba right we're still doing things as we've done in the past and they continue to do so for a long time now as we peer through the gates here you can see the fountain and uh, some of the uh, clocks and uh, actually some of the clocks still say Corona. Let's see if we can get that. If you look closely at this particular clock there, you can see that it says La Corona. And all of them have it. Here we have another shot. There's a small park that's located here. And that's at the entry right here, as you can see, Spanish stucco for the roof. And then towards the back area here would have been their waste disposal area, which still remains a waste disposal area, but is also now a parking lot for some of the tenants. As we look near the entrance here, we can see one of their faux balconies with the cross, Spanish cross. The 
Okay, so we're walking here along La Corona factory. And what we're doing is we're turning the bend. Now, this sits on almost about uh, two acres of land, 2.3, 2.7 acres of land. And you're joining me here as I walk towards the back part of this warehouse, this factory, where tobacco would come in from. So we're, what we're gonna look at now is where the tobacco was coming into the warehouse from. Now it's currently a parking garage as well. As you can see here, these doors have maintained their original red color. So now we're walking to the exact area where tobacco would come in and it would enter the factory in order to be processed and rolled into cigars. As you can see, the old doors, the original old doors that were used, they were sliding doors. I'm not going to enter that. That's private property, but it's basically just a garage now. But tobacco would enter this area here, and as you can see, a little bit of land here, a little pathway towards the back there, and newly installed cameras, of course, because it's a parking garage and people keep their valuable cars in there. Now I can just imagine being one of the line managers and a shipment of tobacco has come up and it's pulled in and I'm directing the guys this way, this way. More than likely 1932, there were some small cars available, but there could have been a different, uh, different manners in, in which the tobacco was hauled in. And basically everyone had to keep attention and make sure that the tobacco was coming in safely through here these doors would be slid open and the tobacco would commence to be pushed into this area up until the up in the factory where the rollers would then begin going through the process of preparing the tobacco for being rolled into cigars and and that was one of the things that that La Corona brand wanted to do they wanted to maintain this assurance in quality despite the fact that they were no longer operating in Cuba. They chose Trenton for the location. They had this building here already. They knew what they were doing was gonna save them a lot of money, but they weren't gonna take any shortcuts because La Corona cigars, along with the other lines that they produce, were America's favorite cigars. They were Winston Churchill's favorite cigars. And so that was the major importance. It was maintaining that quality, maintaining a safe environment for their workers, continuing in the Cuban traditions for their cigar factory and that was very important to this to this company this one last shot of these huge sliding doors and we're going to be leaving the Henry Bach and Clay and Company tobacco factory now and I just want to thank you for watching this video. What will follow is the smoking of the 64 year old cigar. Now we're back. We were about to leave when one of the residents came out and asked us what we were shooting and we let him know what we were doing. And he was actually familiar with the history and actually said that an older uh, gentleman had informed him about the history here. It was a cigar factory. And he even said to me, Winston Churchill used to get his cig cigars here which is a fact. Winston Churchill did have cigars shipped from this factory to his home, and that is how much he loved La Corona cigars. Now, one thing he, the resident said was, you gotta check out the plaque at the front because it's in memory of those who served in World War II. And it just uh, names a couple of people, and it, it, in honor and memory of those who served in World War II, you have the list of names, and then towards the bottom it says the 11th Ward, 9th District. So I think another piece of uh, history here is uh, commemorating those who served in the World War and in World War II specifically, and it just adds to the legacy of this grand palace, if you want to call it that.
So I think with that, we can wrap up this little road trip. And by the way, if you're in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, stop at Papa's uh, Tomato Pies. They make great pizzas. And that's what we did to uh, you know, satisfy the hunger while we were on this road trip. I thank you so much for joining me on this one. Till next time on Backyard Cigars, join me for the smoking of La Corona 1950s Vintage Cigar. So here you will see me remove the band as always because the band went on top of the cellophane. You will then see me carefully, carefully, because this has been well maintained. These cigars that are purchased by this cigar retailer, I will only say the name, I can't say the name, I'm not allowed to, but basically they're purchased from private collectors. They're inspected, authenticated, and if the condition is deemed acceptable, then you have a situation where the retailer purchased a cigar and then sells it to the consumer. Now, as you can see here, this is the cigar, slightly box pressed. La Corona Corona. And I'm just going to give it a light trickle. It's a light trickle that you do. And so never, never get the foot of the cigar wet. If it has, always check to see if it has a pre-drilled hole. This one does not. So under the light trickle, anywhere from, I would say, 8 to 13 seconds. And that's it. That's done. I'm turn that off. Paper towel. Mat it down. I'll just basically put it in paper towel and do that. Okay. And so what happens now is that the cigar, oops, almost dropped it there, I'm trying to give you a better view. The cigar will then be left laying down on the paper towel for about 10 to 15 minutes, give or take. And then it's ready to smoke. And that's where you come in and you get to join me and watch me smoke this vintage cigar from the 1950s. Just want to give you a last peek of the cellophane. Sometimes I keep these, believe it or not. It's just some, if, if the cigar turns out to be extraordinarily good, I'll keep it. And it'll just serve as a reminder of this really, really old cigar that I smoked that was incredible. If it doesn't turn out to be so delicious, then I toss this. <laughs> because what do I need it for, right? I mean, it, it's not like you're, if you're keeping the band or anything like that. But when you have such a memorable cigar sometimes, you just want to keep something to remind you of it or you know just keep that memory alive thank you for joining me as i smoke this cigar that i've had i've had it in my possession now 10 months it arrived and i remember this very well it arrived on october 31st halloween of 2021 and i was so wanting to smoke it right away but i i told myself you know what let it acclimate to my humidor for a few months. And a few months, of course, became several months. And it was stored at a 64-65 RH. I think the lowest that it went during the cold winter uh, was about 63 RH, which is fine when you're aging cigars. This cigar measures in at 6.5 by uh, 43 ring gauge. Some say 42. I, I think it's 42, but there are some publications that say it's a little less than six and a half and maybe a 43 ring gauge but generally these uh panatella types are going to be in that 42 43 so um this it, it's very weird because this cigar actually looks like i kid you not like this could have been candela wrapper that's how, 
and man i don't know if this camera is actually going to give you some justice in 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 the color i'll take some pictures and see if i can attach them but uh so no one really knows what the wrapper on this is even the retailer that sold it to me said we don't have the specs on what la corona but my research indicated that uh la, la corona was very fond like many clear havanas of the time in the 1940s and 50s we are talking about a sumatran wrapper could it possibly be a candela i didn't find any examples of corona candelas so i'm gonna say that age has given it this patina and this is either a, a sumatran wrapper possibly and could could be that it could be a connecticut wrapper connecticut shade wrapper but more likely a sumatran the binder on this one it, it is uh this is handmade so uh we're gonna say that the binder on this could be sumatran as well or it could be cuban a good bet is that it was probably cuban tobacco for the binder but it's you know with a, with a lot of these clear havanas the recipe the general recipe was you either use you were you were using a connecticut shade wrapper or you were using a sumatran wrapper and the binder could go either Cuban, Sumatran, or, or, Ameri or American tobacco as well. So that's, that was the general recipe, right? And then the, to follow that, the filler for the general recipe, all Cuban or a certain percentage Cuban and a certain percentage Puerto Rican tobacco. And occasionally you'd find uh, a blend with Cuban and American tobacco, Connecticut tobacco as well. These were the general blends that you found in those days. Uh, it, it, you know, it, in the way you compare it to today's uh, cigar industry, where, and especially for the American consumer, the American market, where you have all of these different types of tobacco being used nowadays, and the blends just keep getting crazier and crazier, right? And you see all of this kind of uh, uh, change with the boutique cigar. And the boutique cigars, you know, they offer this packaging. It's different. It looks funkier. It gives the cigar a different uh, identity. You know, in the olden days, again, you know, if they switch from brand, one brand to another, they were almost brand loyal to a fault. It was because of price. A few cents here, a few cents there. And that was the working man. He would say, well, if I can get quality for a cent less, then I will. And, and so at that time, the consistency was there. The Cuban tobacco was flowing. This is pre-revolutionary days. Uh, we're talking at a time when a man knew that he had a variety of brands to choose from. And he was going to get a good cigar, more than likely, from any one of them. All he had had to do was decide how much he was willing to pay and that's not to say some brands didn't excel over other brands because they did crops were different they affected the vintages in this and 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 the way that they could move the cigars so uh a good batch would also like very much like today to some degree inspire people to say to themselves whoa that you know those cigars i tried from from bob were really really good that they buy them up but then next crop comes perhaps they can't you know maintain certain consistency perhaps or it's just slightly off or maybe the price is a bit higher and all of a sudden the consumer makes the choice i'm going to just i'm just gonna smoke something else and it was very easy uh back then you'd get a lot of free samples uh the the guarantees were there for the consumer that if i bought a box and i didn't like them I could just return them and get my money back and 
this was the cigar that they said all cigars were judged by. So let's see how we judge it today. I normally don't show my clipping on TV, but sure. <laughs> that was a nice flat cut. And uh, I dare say a perfect cut because I really did not want to apply too much. Even though we did the water and we rinsed it and we gave it that extra hydration there, uh, you, you just never know sometimes when you're clipping one of these old vintage cigars. So extra care is needed. Again, I'm estimating this cigar to be about from 1955. And I mean, it could be anywhere from 54 to 58 to be exact, but, or, or to take a good guess, that would make this cigar 67 years old. And in my possession again for 10 months. I will say that when I was looking for information on it, I did find that Half Wheel actually did get their hands on one of these and, and reviewed it. And I'm not gonna lie, I read the review, well, I skimmed through it. And, and I got to the final point where it, he gave you like, his score, right? I'm not gonna tell you what he said at that time, but I'll tell you later. I didn't read too much about you know what he was tasting so much as I got to the summary of it and he, you know, expressed his uh, dislikes. But you saw everything that I saw uh, in terms of like the newspaper articles and everything and Zeno Davidoff talking about how, you know, it was the king of cigars. So when you read all of that and you've heard all of that, you, you still remain a little bit, you know, open because you say to yourself, well, may, who knows what condition Charlie's was. And he admits, hey, you know, maybe mine wasn't well kept. I mean, from what I'm seeing, it, the cigar looks fine. It was well kept but for the most part. I am having some construction issues with it. They've started off kind of quickly and have progressed and they haven't corrected themselves. So I'm going to try to look past them and just look for that flavor, which what I've gotten so far has been sort of a cardboard and I've gotten that before from a vintage cigar so that's all I'm getting right now it's mellow it's smooth that underlying creaminess that was talked about as an original flavor from those days it's just not there very dry finish um, now it seems that the, the burn line has corrected itself a bit uh, it's still something I'm gonna keep an eye out for yeah it's a cardboard dry finish Say like an old hay you know just like some some hay that's just been rolling around and uh, collecting dust I think that's a good description it feels weird to talk about it now in the sense of how this was the premium choice for the aristocracy in in England and obviously uh, Winston Churchill loved the cigar very much and Americans loved it as well when it became a clear Havana in, uh, nine, in, the, in the 1930s so it, it, was, it was something it was a, one would say a lot of counterfeit cigars were made of this cigar so when you think about like Cohiba and the counterfeiting and all of the fraud that you know fraudulent labels that were made to pass off cigars as a Cohiba cigar remember when we did the video uh, when I did the video on cigar band history and we talked about the reason for cigar bands why they were created 
and uh, they were created back in Cuba for for the in, intent and purpose of protecting their product and and then later on it expanded into marketing of course and brand identity well la corona corona definitely had an identity and the brand was copied and despite having a very uh well-known band it was easy to it wasn't the hardest thing to copy so um a lot of people did that in those days so there were certain ways of ensuring that you were getting the real deal the the right corona corona and you had to go to certain tobacconists You know, it's just some hay. I just got a bit of pepper in that finish. It's uh, it was it was not a sharp pepper. It was it was a dusty pepper. Again, some sharp corners with a little bit more pepper, uh, but really hasn't changed much. We'll keep in touch. I feel like it's waking up a little bit, but it, it's almost as if it's kind of expected for me because I know that these cigars had this whole thing about the heart of the cigar type of, you know, theory where there was a certain part of the cigar that was just really really good and and really hit a stride it was it was their way of saying when you get to this third you're going to really experience everything that the cigar has to offer and it would last for quite a bit until you get to that almost that pre-nub state and uh in some cases the nub was super tasty as well though they didn't recommend you to smoke it down to that uh, especially in england in england it was a lot about the three-fourths rule or the Creates rule and you'd smoke it up to that and, and it was customary to put it down after that so one of these days we'll do a, a video where we talk about you know the history of smoking it down to the nub maybe that's interesting I don't know but when did that start happening it, it wasn't a thing in the past even my grandfather talks about smoking a cigar to a certain point and he would admit you know yeah obviously heat will let you know when it's uncomfortable and it's time to put down your cigar but other times uh if you're really enjoying that cigar and you want to take it further you know uh in his case he would just say i just put the cigar down and light another cigar <laughs> i mean that's what i do i wouldn't keep smoking it down to the nub and i never remember seeing nubs in my grandfather's trade uh maybe once or twice who knows could have been low on cigars knew he didn't have any others so he's gonna smoke it down to the nub but um customarily i'd see you know something like that left and uh he smoked perfectos he smoked uh lanceros i didn't see him with too many lanceros but i know that he told me he tried them and but his his favorite were the perfectos and uh the churchills and the robustos those vitolas and he also liked the uh raw shield size uh because he needed quick smokes so uh panatelas like this were another one were definitely one of his favorites as well especially on the go we didn't you know this this cigar right here wouldn't last as long so it was a quick smoke and uh at the racetrack you know you'd you'd want that churchill so that it can last you throughout the races and he'd take a few with him and he'd smoke throughout the races and guess why i'm talking about all of that is because we're talking about a cigar from his times right and and the times that he enjoyed cigar smoking so it takes me back a little bit to to that um 1958 or 1950s Five, which is what I've uh, estimated this cigar to be at. Right now, it's a little. It's got a little. Um, I'd say like a little grassy 
note or a little bit of twang if you might want to say that with some extremely old hay and a bit of pepper now that right there was more like a pepper cream now since you've been gone um, the cigar kind of did a little turn for the better got a little pepper creamy started giving me some more cream and the only thing that I will say is that it has it has a slightly tannic flavor or finish to it note a tannic note to it and that old hay doesn't really mesh well with the cream so it's a little bit of a competition between that creamy note let's say the creamy underlying note as suggested but as as i'm really experiencing it yeah it's nice now you know what's killing this cigar really is that that tannic finish or that that old bitter pepper like note that is just is not fresh pepper anymore it's 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 something else and it's not pleasing in the finish and it's drying on the palate as well Yeah, it really sticks to the palate and dries it. If I, 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 I'm probably gonna have to go get water with the, on the next take because I, I didn't have any water. I haven't eaten anything actually for about maybe an hour and a half, and I had a light breakfast. That's it, and I haven't had anything. And I'm thinking to myself, if I were enjoying this for a non-review i would have some really good juicy bourbon to counter that drying effect it's got cream it's just the way it lands it's just that finish it really f's everything up but other than that you went once you hit that you know final third it it got that pepper cream and you know initial bursts of some pepper detection but then it just got really tannic i'm gonna sum it up when i come back you know it's kind of hard to judge this cigar so i'm not gonna judge it i'm really not why because it's sort of like uh meeting a retired 70 year old former Mr. America or Mr. Olympia and you know he's not the same anymore obviously he's not in his prime he's not that same individual physically speaking um, it, it, it's it's similar to this because it's like I can sense the promise of the cigar and would have would have offered back then with the bit of creaminess that I got and I know that it would have been more refined and it wouldn't have been as tannic in the finish or at least that's what I want to believe and I do believe that I'm correct but this is 67 years later maybe more and to judge it as a cigar what I will judge it is as a cigar tasting experience I'm still getting to try a piece of history here. I'm still getting to share this with you. The history behind the cigar, this king of cigars. And, and it's, it's still a, a fun experience. You know, throughout the research, throughout the, the trips, and let me tell you, the trip to 
to uh, Trenton was a long trip, uh, hour and a half drive back and forth. And it, it was something that I felt was worth it, especially to share it with you. But, um, but it, it was a treat and I had fun and, uh, and I'm still having fun even if I'm not fully enjoying the cigar the way individuals would have enjoyed it in 1955. I still sensed a very good quality tobacco here. It's just been too many years for this baby. It has. And really right now, just that finish, it's grassy, it's it's tannic, it's slightly cardboardish, it's unappealing and really a huge turnoff when what you really want is something that will finish the way it slightly starts where it's a little pepper creamy and then you just don't get that, it's a disappointing thing but look Six to seven years old, I'm not gonna judge you. I'm gonna take this band off and I'm gonna keep it in my collection. As a memory, I will be chucking the cellophane, but I will try to smoke this for just a few minutes more, just because. And I wanna thank all of you for joining me on this ride and sharing in this little experience with me. You know, it's a nice treat to do these things every now and then. I paid about $30 on the Eastern Coast for this cigar. And it's not worth $30 for the cigar smoking experience. It's worth $30 for the history. And, and, and to just get it, a chance to uh, sample that history. And with that, I will leave you and I will thank you once more, ladies and gentlemen, for being a part of uh, the backyard cigar experience and everything else that goes along with it, even if it means a trip to Trenton. So thank you again. Till next time.